Good morning, everyone. Happy March 1st. I'm uh, pleased to see many of you here already, whom I'm uh, taking account of. I'm secretly taking attendance so that I uh, can keep track of who's coming. And that's always fun to, to know who's here. Uh, before I get started with the slides this morning, I'd like to tell you a couple of, of things. Um, the first is that uh, in case you've wondered why I keep coming back to the ocean, um, I bought an Aqualung when I was just finishing high school, kind of bought it on the sly. My parents didn't even know about it, um, but I managed to dive for about eight hours with that and in the late 50s. And, uh, and then after that in the 80s on some trips for another six hours with rented ones. So I spent about 14 hours uh, breathing um, filtered compressed air um, like uh, Cousteau did. And I've been a great admirer of Cousteau over the years. So that's part of the rationale of why I decided to talk about the future of the sea. Um, the second point was that there's this company called Amazon that we're all getting familiar with. And like many other companies, they have cookies. And so they can tell what interests you. And a couple of months ago, they thought that I might be interested in this book that I'm reviewing today called Future C. And uh, I never bought the book, but I did get it on Kindle and read it there. So I don't have uh, um, uh, a copy of the book to show you. But under during the past a couple of weeks while I've been reviewing that book, um, um, I came across two other books that I like to show you briefly, and I've taken a few slides from both those books uh, that at the end of the talk. So this this talk is is mostly a review of uh, Future C, but it touches on these two other ones. This one I'm going to show you is called The Outlaw Ocean, and it's written by uh, Ian Urbina. Um, he's an amazing guy. He's a uh, um, a celebrated author, uh, won a number of prizes for his remarkable reporting. And he's, he really embeds himself with um, uh, people. He's a reporter for the New York Times. He's won a Pulitzer Prize for um, various things, uh, trained at the University of Chicago, now lives in Washington, DC with his family. There's a picture of him here. Uh, I can't see it too well, but you get an idea. And uh, basically, he's, he focuses on the difficulties, uh, even if we do get treaties to look after the sea, how do we address this issue? Uh, how do we make sure that the laws, um, international laws, which are hard to enforce in any case on something as uh, uh, wide open as the sea? So that's an interesting story. I recommend it to you, although it's a bit depressing. Um, he talks about slavery, particularly of Cambodian youth who are literally shanghaied, um, uh, as the term has gone, onto uh, boats involved in Ill illegal fishing in the uh, Southern Ocean around Antarctica. Uh, it's an incredible story. I'll just show a couple of slides from that. The other one is uh, I had the pleasure, and I think I, I told some of you about traveling with Jacques Cousteau's son in the Caribbean. Uh, a few years ago. And so when I found this book of his was made available, I purchased a copy. Um, so this is by Jean-Michel Cousteau. It basically deals with the national marine sanctuaries and around the United States, uh, but it also includes American Samoa and Hawaii. Um, so I'll show a few slides from that too. That's a more upbeat, uh, but quite uh, a, a diametrically opposed to um, uh, this book because he focuses on the more conventional view that we should have um, um, these marine sanctuaries and uh, uh, not try and deal too much with the wide open. So let me get to the slides. We're going to, uh, if you want to ask questions, Louise will help you so that you don't have to type it in. You can, we can actually, unmute your mics and we can talk. And this is 39 slides, we've got lots of time. So 
I'd be happy to entertain any questions you have as the as they come up. So we'll get to the desktop here and go from there. Need to do a little desktop management here. Okay. Um, one thing I'm using a better mouse today, so that should allow me to um, move the slides a little better. And I'm going to minimize myself so that we can see what's going on here. So this book is called Future Sea, and the subtitle is How to Rescue and Protect the World's Oceans. Um, and it's written by Deborah Rowan Wright. And what, I, what you see on the right there is a way she broken up future and the subtitle is all there. And then the background, you can see some, some um, kelp and some fish wandering around through the letters. So uh, it's kind of a jazzy cover. Um, Richard, I don't think we're seeing that. Oh, really? We're oh, seeing uh, a screen that says Zoom. You're seeing what? A screen that says Zoom. Oh dear, isn't that funny? Uh, let me stop sharing and see if I can correct that. Huh. Well, thanks for telling me, but I don't know how to correct that. I will. Hmm. I don't want to mess up here as I, because it shows up on my screen just fine. Um, I'll try share screen again and see if that will do it this time. How does that? That's great, thank you. Good, so, um, this is the title slide that I described a moment ago. And this is the picture of the author. Um, she is a longtime marine conservation advocate. She lives in Oxford, England. Um, she spent decades apparently supporting um, piecemeal strategies to protect the oceans. And yet despite this, our ocean life support system is buckling under human pressures. Um, that was a statement made somewhere along in, the, in her website, I think. Um, this is an interesting picture of her and one of her little pet animals in the, in the barnyard. She looks like a, she gets right in there with, with the creatures she loves. Uh, we've been approaching marine conservation backward. This is the theme of her book. Instead of regulating individual fisheries or putting boundaries around select areas, we need to protect the whole thing. It's innovative thinking. I'm not sure if it will work, but at least it gets people thinking in a, in a different point of view. Um, and this is from the preface. Um, she says, what we know about life under the waves is outweighed by what we don't know. The certainty of uncertainty. Reminds me a little bit of one of our former um, defense uh, uh, politicians who focused on the uncertainty, what we don't know. Uh, but I think uh, this goes further. It says we should recognize this as, as the heart of our relationship with the ocean and the way we use the sea's resources. She said the safety measure type of thinking, thinking of safety known as the precautionary approach is an essential element of planning for the oceans. By the way, the little image on the left you've seen before, it's a type of coral, but in the deep sea does not depend on photosynthesis. I put it up as a contrast to a picture I'll show at the end of the photosynthetic corals that are in the mark. Uh, superficial oceans and build reefs, um, just as a little aside. But getting back to the main thing, I really like the next uh, couple of slides. 
she does this at the beginning of the book, and I think it gets the point across very well. She talks about a, a fish called a slime head. And slime heads are conspicuous for their large heads, their large eyes and bright colors. But the head is especially notable for its network of mucus filled channels, which you can see here. Uh, and this is basically an extension of the lateral line. So if a fish has big eyes and a very highly developed sensory system from the, the lateral line, you can imagine that it's probably a deep sea fish. And um, uh, sure enough, it is. Um, I didn't know this at all about the fish. This is a better picture of a real one as opposed to the diagram. But I didn't realize that it was discovered in the deep seas off New Zealand as recently as 1979. And people might wonder, well, why wasn't it seen before then? Well, it really tends to hang out uh, just in the deep seas, does not come up near the surface. They called it a roughy because of the spines and they decided to focus on the orange color. And it was much more saleable in our fish markets than slime head. And so it was, it was a smart marketing term. And I remember shortly after I moved to Madison that this came on the market or and I moved here in 1980. And I thoroughly enjoyed the fish, and uh, it was popular with the entire family. It had a nice uh, uh, flavory taste, and it was um, not too fatty, and it just um, it's, it was just enjoyed by everyone. Um, but here's the point. Uh, fisheries managers used guesswork instead of facts to set, to set catch quotas, and they took what they knew about similar sized species living in shallow seas and applied that um, ir irrelevant knowledge to the orange roughy, it was very, very deep. And its life cycle is 10 times longer than the superficial fish of similar genus uh, or same genus in different species. Uh, and so by, by doing that, uh, they badly misjudged. And that's why the numbers plummeted over 20 years. And I began to wonder around the turn of the century why we weren't getting any any um, roughy anymore in the, in the markets. It turns out we'd fish them out. Uh, the damage was worsened by using weighted nets that destroyed deep corals and sponges that was dragged over the area where the fish gathered to feed and spawn. So that's an example of uh, the importance of cautionary thinking that uh, Deborah is trying to talk about. Well, let's move on now to the basic premise of how we use the sea. She says the onus should be on sea users to show that they don't ruin the undersea habitat and contaminate waters and jeopardize wildlife, rather than having the onus on the conservationists like herself. Why should they have to prove that marine life needs to be protected? Uh, with all the sea protected from harm, and that's her basic tenant concept, instead of just scattered oases of safe water within emptied oceans, uh, there would be areas of responsible use within the healthy oceans. And she thinks that the marine commercial areas should be designated rather than marine protected areas. Totally inverted way of thinking. She said, we can still fish the water, ship cargo across them, make minerals and take minerals and oil from beneath the seabed, but only in a way that safeguards marine habitats and sea life. I, I have a friend in New York City who's an international lawyer and I sent some of this material to her and asked her what she thought of it. And she's a generation younger than I am, but I knew her when I lived in New York. And um, uh, she thought it was interesting, but she didn't think it's very practical. And I, th I think she's right, but uh, neither is what we're doing very practical. So, uh, um, but I, I like at least <laughs> the way she thinks about it. And let's go on into this law of the sea. What's it all about that she, uh, that she is bothered by that we have so far. It was initially started in 1982. It was signed by 104 countries, not by the United States, incidentally, Venezuela, Israel, or Turkey. And uh, why was it not signed? Why was there some ruckus over it? Well, the provisions were judged as disadvantageous to the American economy, as infringements on our sovereignty, and it favored the economies of communist nations in some states. And so uh, we, since we objected, and this was done through the UN, we have a lot of clout there, or did. Uh, the treaty was revised to offset these objections and duly signed by President Clinton in July of 1994. However, despite all these modifications made for us, 
some Republican members of Congress with an entrenched distrust of the UN continue to block its ratification. And so the United States is the only major power not to be a legitimate party to this law of the sea. But what is it? What is this law of the sea? There's an emblem on it here in the upper uh, right uh, in a map in red are the countries who have not signed the treaty. And of course we make up a big chunk of that. Um, uh, other countries, Venezuela, Peru apparently, uh, and a few other Turkey and a few other countries have not signed it, uh, but that basically says that the area of the seabed beyond the limits of national jurisdiction, as well as its resources, are the common heritage of mankind, the exploration and exploitation of which shall be carried out for the benefit of mankind as a whole, irrespective of the geographical location of the states. States were given a lot of leeway in where they could define uh, their limits. Uh, some states chose our countries chose just 20 miles, some 100 miles, some 200 miles offshore that they determined that they would control. So the open seas that you see there, these large expanses of white, the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, Indian Ocean and so on, would be the areas that we're talking about, particularly what's heavily fished, uh, this area we call the Southern Ocean here along Antarctica, which is a little bit blown out of proportion in this map. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about the outlaw ocean. But uh, that's the basic uh, concept of it. it. I haven't read the whole thing or, or even uh, much of it because it's, it's like all these treaties, it's huge. But it is based on the tragedy of the commons. If you have shared resources lying beyond territorial jurisdictions, such as wild fish in the high seas, they're in a stateless unpoliced place and they're open to overuse by free riders not sufficiently controlled by any flag state. And um, these countries are acting only in their own interest. Commercial fishing fleets tend to overexploit the common resource. Um, and just coming back a little bit to the final uh, UN law of the sea in 1994, it has been described as visionary, as a remarkable achievement in global consensus. People sure worked on it for 12 years. Um, uh, and so they think it's pretty good for international lawmaking, but it has some serious problems. It fails to safeguard the marine environment. Uh, for now, the law is splintered, vague, and lacks power. But uh, perhaps we shouldn't just forget about it because since 1994, new technological advances in the ability of fishing vessels to track and capture fish, although they've hastened their demise, they've also allowed us to keep an eye on this, and I'll, I'll get back to this in a few slides. Um, there also, there's more of an interest now um, uh, for looking for cosmetics and pharmaceutical uh, products from the ocean. Um, also some minerals, manganese nodules um, are of interest in the bottom of the sea and so on. Although I think the idea of pharmaceuticals is a bit overplayed. Um, uh, sea cucumbers were very popular, have been for the past um, 30 or 40 years. And um, yeah, we've made a few things from there uh, for cancer, but precious few, in my opinion, that are, that are important. Uh, people have compared the law of the sea to the Montreal Protocol. And why did that one work and the law of, sea, of the sea not? Um, and the reason isn't so hard to figure out. Uh, it's totally different. Uh, this treaty provides a timetable on which the production of fluorochlorinated methane must be stopped and eventually eliminated to prevent depletion of the protective ozone. We've heard about this ozone hole around the South Pole. Fluorochlorinated methane is basically freon, and there are a lot of different varieties of that. Basically, you take a methane compound, as you know, it's carbon with four hydrogens around it, you knock three of those four hydrogens off and you put one chlorine and two fluorines uh, to substitute the three hydrogens that you knocked off and you have basically freon. And it's a uh, horrible, uh, even worse than methane uh, uh, greenhouse gas. But um, um, it, was, it was banned basically because of people really got concerned about the ozone around this. South Pole, particularly people in Australia who came from um, many of them with uh, uh, poorly melanated skin. Um, and so uh, they were very susceptible 
to uh, skin cancer from the ultraviolet rays. And in fact, they have six times higher skin cancer incidence than the rest of the world in Australia. Um, they slather on all of this suntan lotion and all of them, no matter how good they claim to be to the fish, are awful. Uh, six tons of suntan lotion gets washed into the ocean every year. Seems like an awful lot. People must really lather it on. But even the simple ones with zinc oxide paste, zinc oxide does not go along very well with fish gills, nor with um, corals. And considering what's happening to the Great Barrier Reef, I wish the Australians would just put on a t-shirt and not spend so much time lathering on suntan lotion. But anyway, uh, getting back to the point, um, uh, the Montreal Protocol is totally different. Uh, you're, you're trying to protect us from cancer as opposed to uh, fiddling with food supplies that people don't take very seriously. Um, she also points out some things that, that we sometimes take for granted. Uh, bad fishing, uh, she points out, uh, relates to very destructive ways that they're caught. Bottom trawling, that is dragging trawls across the seabed, has been... Um, uh, done more and more, and that's a terrible way to treat the seafloor and uh, many of the uh, bottom dwelling fish that are that are crucial there. And um, uh, it's just a should be, I think, uh, banned. Uh, worse yet is the use of cyanide and dynamite in fishing. And there are some parts of the world that are not well regulated where they actually use cyanide and dynamite to uh, to kill many fish and then they just come along and pick the ones up that are dead on the surface. There's another thing you can look it up at shocked me called Muroami. And this is reef destruction where people come in, um, indigenous populations who live near the reefs and uh, just uh, take sticks and beat at them until the fish uh, are, are shocked and, and come to the surface and they can skim them up with nets. Uh, then there's long lining, a very common practice uh, with many hooks along the line, and you can not only get the fish that you want, but uh, a lot of uh, bycatch with that, uh, which is a shame, and they're destroyed. And in indiscriminate fishing where giant nets catch everything. The pursing, I remember working after high school, I got a job out on the West Coast uh, with the International Pacific Salmon Fisheries Commission, and they had some gill netters, those were the smaller boats, and then they had these big boats called um, purse seiners. And these boats were pretty amazing. Uh, they, would, they would have this big seine with, with weighted nets at the bottom and cranes on the top of the boat. They're much bigger than a, than a gill netter boat. And they could uh, uh, sometimes use sonar, tell where the fish were and go around the fish and then just pull in, tighten in, the weighted bottom of the net and just lift up these huge nets just full of fish. And um, it was a very good way to catch the salmon, uh, but uh, uh, sometimes there's quite a bit of bycatch in those too. Uh, I didn't see it at the time when I was there, but uh, back in 1956, uh, uh, it wasn't hard at all for them to, to just uh, bring in mostly the, the uh, salmon. I worked in the, in the uh, canneries. So I didn't see their bycatch that came in. So I would, didn't, wasn't really quite aware of that. Um, then there are more bad ideas. She points out the absurdity of subsidies that include billions of public dollars that support fishing industries. Most state subsidies drive overfishing practices by companies that wouldn't otherwise be commercially viable. She points out that most of the funding goes to industrial fleets toward the cost of their fuel, which helps them operate in the high seas as well as building vessels and upgrading fishing gear. This keeps the global fishing fleet much too large. She does, she has estimated it's two and a half times the capacity capable, uh, compatible, I mean, with available fish stocks. So um, uh, that's an interesting thing. Many of you are aware that the cod uh, fish of the uh, banks off Newfoundland, which have been common all through our early years as children and as young adults, and that's back, basically that whole uh, cod, uh, those banks have been largely fished out. Uh, there is another, by the way, she, she's mentioned to be thorough, a number of other agreements in the books. There's one called uh, 
uh, a sequel treaty to the law of the sea. It's called the Fish Stocks Agreement or FSA. That was in 1995. And, and it addresses fish species that cross national boundaries and migrate long distances. It was a major step forward in setting up a modern strategy for long-term conservation of particular fish stocks. So that's good. Um, and it calls to avoid adverse impacts on the marine environment, preserve the biodiversity and minimize risk of long-term or irreversible effects of fishing operations. So she wanted to bring our attention to that. And then there's yet another convention before that in 1992 called the Convention on Biodiversity. And this aims to conserve the Earth's biological diversity in a sustainable and equitable way to preserve natural habitats, wild species, and genetic resources. She might, might points out that sustainable, it's a word that we have in our, as a title of our group and it wouldn't hurt to review it. She defines it as a term whose meaning has become unclear through overuse. But it reminds us that the Oxford Dictionary defines it as conserving an ecological balance by avoiding depletion of natural resources. 196 states have signed and ratified this treaty only the Vatican, Andorra, and of course the United States have not done so. So now we have some global oversight uh, in this century. All of the states fishing beyond their national jurisdictions actually did comply with the FSA provisions and the high seas, uh, if they did, the high seas would be fairly safe from harm. So we can go on this, this website called Fishing Watch and you can take any region what tends to come up um, initially is uh, the southern tip of South America. And you can see uh, all these various uh, uh, fishing fleets identified. Uh, I'm not exactly sure of the difference uh, in this map. I haven't studied it enough to know the difference between the, the light blue and the white. But uh, I think it's fascinating that, that uh, these people are uh, checking in. There is some global oversight. It, it helps them, I think, uh, define uh, where they can legally fish and where they should not. Um, so it's welcome um, on both sides, on the side of the fisheries, because they can um, tell uh, where they are and, and it is, make sure that they're in a legal area. And um, unfortunately, some of the rogue uh, fishing boats do turn their equipment off, and so they're not visible. And uh, so that can get around it. Uh, there's a problem with, with uh, different kinds of fish. We all enjoy shrimp, but shrimp uh, have a particular problem because while it represents 2% of the world total catch of all fish by weight, it produces more than a third of the world's bycatch. And uh, that's unfortunate. I haven't been on a shrimp boat, so I haven't seen exactly how they net them and, and catch them in their traps, but uh, it's unfortunate that um, uh, there's so much bycatch. Um, in this case, in this image, um, they're just left on the deck and swept over uh, through the scuppers uh, with no intention of, of saving any of them. Uh, but by the time they come up in these, in these uh, traps and nets, they're uh, often uh, so hypoxic that they don't recover in any case. Um, there is some good news amongst all this. There are special rigs uh, sea turtles are being protected by special rigs and these these are special booms and nets that allow turtles to escape so that we shouldn't overlook some of the good news um, and it's nice that the sea turtles are getting a, um, some protection. Uh, there's something that Deborah was not keen on and I, I differ from her in that opinion. Uh, she's opposed to global aquaculture in general. I'm not sure that she's opposed to it all but she certainly does not um, seem to be very enthused about it. But I'm very impressed by this graph. This didn't come from her book, it came from the internet. And I've forgotten exactly where, probably just a, a Google search for aquaculture. But what I'm fascinated by in this graph is the history of the past uh, 70 years. And you can see the solid orange line at the bottom is the inland fisheries. This would be lakes and rivers. It would include the Great Lakes. It would include the rivers of China and India. Um, where uh, various uh, fish from, um, uh, well, even grass carp, for example, and tilapia and that sort of thing um, 
are, um, but it, it, it's steadily mounting. But look at the, at the, um, aquaculture let me get this straight for a minute yeah this is i'm sorry i got this wrong uh the aquaculture is in blue i was forgetting this and this is what's been grown inland and this is the ocean oceanic uh this is wild capture i beg your pardon and so the uh, the inland capture in the Great Lakes, just netting and um, hooking fish uh, has been growing steadily. But notice that on the, on the open oceans, it's been quite steady for the past uh, 25 years or so or more. Uh, and partly because the fish stocks have been running out and the pressure on them, I think has been significantly reduced by uh, this pale blue uh, curve here showing the marine aquaculture. And uh, there are some damages, and she does point out the waste uh, that happens from the fish farms the, that uh, along the shores where the farming is done. Uh, there's a lot of uh, waste from those fish farms put in the oceans, uh, that there are heavy catches of wild fish needed in order to feed the penned salmon, for example, and that for shrimp ponds, there's damage to the coastal wetlands. So that's true, um, but um, uh, I still think that uh, this figure demonstrates um, both inland aquaculture uh, in the rivers of uh, China, in particular, and some of our rivers as well, as well as the marine. This is, this is a dramatic shift uh, in this century um, to show how aquaculture has taken some of the pressure off these uh, heavily depleted and and um, uh, wild stalks that are shown in orange and um, peach color here. And here are the five commonest types of farm seafood. Um, on the left, we have the grass carp that, um, I don't know if any of you have tried, I've, I've never tried them, but there's not only a lot of value in them in billions of dollars, but uh, a huge tonnage, more than any other fish. Uh, so I presume most of that is Asian. Uh, the tilapia is catching on worldwide and they're doing pretty well and they've got a reasonable value. Uh, the Atlantic salmon, of course, has the greatest value of all of them uh, because it's, it's priced highly and appreciated as a very tasty fish food and it's doing pretty well as a harvest. The shrimp is doing exceptionally well and also uh, very well financially. Uh, the, the oyster, uh, not, not so much, but still a very important uh, uh, food to protect because of its filtering nature of the estuaries and, and ocean coastlines. Um, I thought this was interesting. This has to do with research on breeding and shows when uh, we first got into research on breeding to improve uh, the quality of the fish. And uh, uh, that started back in 1971 for salmon but uh, people are quite fascinated with, uh, with uh, grass carp and um, the geneticists in China are trying to breed them with boneless fillets. So uh, that'll be interesting. Just like we get uh, grapes that are seedless and, and other things with plants, they're now doing genetics uh, on the fish to make them more palatable and easier for us to enjoy. Uh, but I think it's a fascinating uh, uh, overview of farmed seafood. Um, this shows the salmon fishing in Chile. Now they talk about Atlantic salmon being grown in Chile and you wonder what on earth are they doing with Atlantic salmon? Well, as, as most of you might know, uh, Atlantic salmon are far more uh, impervious, I should say, less sensitive to uh, uh, sea lice and various other uh, viral and bacterial infections. They're much hardier than Pacific salmon. I'm not quite sure why, but it seems to have been built into their into their genes. And uh, uh, so they withstand the, con the condensed uh, environments of many places around the world. So uh, the Atlantic salmon, uh, unfortunately, sometimes they spill out into the Pacific Ocean, even though they make great efforts to avoid that from happening. So if you catch a salmon in the Pacific Ocean, there's a fairly good chance uh, 
I think it's one out of four or one out of five, maybe higher, uh, that that uh, wild caught Pacific salmon is in fact an Atlantic salmon, but uh, because they're they're uh, uh, quite resistant to uh, uh, various infectious diseases. Anyway, this is uh, where some of the farming is done in Chile, and I thought it uh, uh, it's interesting. I personally like uh, uh, the farmed Atlantic salmon of Chile. It's one of my favorite types of salmon. It gets an orange label. It's not as red as uh, so. It's not as bad as as some uh, areas, but uh, but I I sure like the taste. To me, it's uh, just the perfect match of uh, fatty flesh and lean flesh and flavor. I find is just uh, my very favorite fish of all, personally. So uh, I'm I'm uh, personally giving it a thumbs up. But I recognize that there are some problems with uh, with fish farming and I'm hoping that they will um, keep it uh, as good as it has been and, and perhaps improve it. Uh, a little bit of talk, I'm not talking much about plastics, but I can refer you to this website here, www.net-works.com for knowing more about what's done. I'll show you a few pictures from their website, but I'm impressed by this, um, these statistics. They say here that there'll be one ton of plastic for every, uh, I think it's two or three tons of fish within five years. But within 30 years, there will be more plastic than fish. Um, they say that fishing communities in Southeast Asia will be some of the hardest hit by this increase in plastic. And the next couple of slides will show this basic, basically is a pictorial or pictograph of community organizations with shared guard houses doing special seaweed farming and making attempts to uh, rescue uh, nets that are carelessly left behind and they can recycle some of those and uh, make use of them rather than just throw them in landfills. <clears throat> so it's quite a, an active uh, organization. This is some pictures of, of uh, harvesting the nets and some of the damaged seaweed that gets clogged in the nets. Uh, the beach boats in the Philippines, where they can see these nets are piled up, and then they bring them in uh, and weigh them uh, uh, for recycling. Um, and so this is the network supply chain. So I, I'm glad to see that happening in areas where uh, um, net misuse and uh, problems with plastic seems to be especially prone. Coming now to this uh, book called The Outlaw Ocean, and this fellow. Ian Urbina, um, he's working with an organization called Sea Shepherd or did for about a year he lived on their vessel. And he also lived on some of the uh, other fishing vessels that, uh, uh, and had pictures in his book of the dreadful living conditions. Uh, but this map focuses on a rogue fishing vessel called the Thunder. It, it began following them the chase began in December of 2014, and um, for five months, uh, they, they followed them doggedly and had some encounters. There are two different uh, boats that followed them. One was called the Bob Barker, and um, there was a second boat. I've forgotten uh, the name of that. Um, I think it was called the Sam, Sam Simon. Anyway, so there were two boats that followed relentlessly and sometimes harassed um, uh, these boats. They didn't, um, they weren't nasty, but they came dangerously close and, and, and it really, they called for them to board them so they could inspect it. And the, the people on the rogue ship, the Thunder said, you don't have any rights to board it. And they probably didn't, but they, they tried hard to uh, psychologically uh, threaten them. And they were so successful that uh, in this distance here, just mapped out from there to there is the distance from New York to Los Angeles. They're going around the Cape of Good Hope, around into the equatorial regions of Africa. Here's Madagascar and here's Antarctica over here. So it's a, it's a nonprofit maritime environmental group. And uh, uh, they this was the, uh, Interpol felt this was the very worst rogue ship in the world. And they were determined to follow it. So these are pictures of, of them following in here. You can see them following it here. Here's a Shearwater and Albatross 
flying around. He senses that there's going to be some fish thrown overboard. And uh, uh, finally, after uh, they got near, near the coast of Africa, uh, the people on board recognized that, uh, that they were going to uh, lose, they were getting a lot of pressure to uh, meet with customs officials on an island off the coast of Africa. And they decided that they did not want to let their ship be boarded where there was clear evidence of illegal fishing. And so they scuttled it, or at least they, they, it shows every sign that it was scuttled. Uh, there's no proof on it in any logs, uh, but uh, here it went down. And these are the people on the Sea Shepherd, um, remarkably dedicated people. I imagine they're paid uh, a certain amount. There are women and men uh, living in a collegial atmosphere and determined that they're helping to take care of the ocean. So one has to marvel at uh, the struggles that go on in the Outlaw Ocean. I found it a fascinating book. It was only $7.77, I think, on on um, uh, for the hardcover, cheaper that way than any other way. So I ordered it and I've been reading parts of it. And it's, it's a scary book. I wouldn't advise it for, for bedtime reading, but it's, uh, it's thrilling all the same. And then moving on to other aspects of the oceans that have not been discussed at all yet is the idea of sound. Uh, these are two pictures. This is pristine, uh, perhaps a uh, hundred years ago. Uh, where there are no motorized vessels um, and very little noise. Uh, coral reefs are abundant, sea animals are doing fine, just occasional earthquakes here and there, um, and some human-made sounds, but nothing very much, lots of kelp forest. And then we enter this period that we call the Anthropocene, that is the period in geologic history dominated by Homo sapiens. And we have noise from low-flying planes, ship traffic, fishing boats, uh, seismic surveys where they're looking for oil by bouncing um, sonar off the off the bottom of the ocean and looking for pockets of oil. Uh, they do pile driving for the so-called offshore wind turbines to drive these things into the bedrock. And that makes a terrible noise. And I don't know if any of you have been underwater when people are making noises, but uh, Cousteau called it the silent world in his very first book. And I suppose when he first entered the Mediterranean, um, ocean off of Toulon um, uh, 70, 80 years ago, that uh, uh, it may have been quiet, but uh, noise is really amplified, as you probably well know, and especially whales communicate very effectively, and they can become very disoriented. Military ships uh, use sonar, uh, and it, it seriously affects the whales, particularly the beaked whales that are very, very sensitive to noise, and the coral reefs are uh, uh, not specifically damaged by sound, but probably uh, not made any better from it um, because some of the fish are bothered. Well, then here is the future. We could look above here at, at, a, at a poorly managed future where uh, glaciers are greatly uh, reduced and, and changing the chemistry of the oceans. We'll hear about that, I think, next week, uh, particularly the salinity and warmth of the oceans. Uh, there are stronger winds as a result of the storms. We just saw that in, in Texas, and we get that from the hurricanes every year. Um, all kinds of uh, freight going back and forth from China around the world. Um, lots of these uh, turbines uh, uh, blasted into the underlying rock and uh, increased pile driving. Wildlife in the coral reef is reduced and underwater mining going on. It's a uh, it's uh, the future with business as usual. But if we have a well-managed future, it could be a lot better. And they even suggest floating turbines rather than bedrock mounted ones. I'm not quite sure how that could be done. They might have to be smaller on a bigger platform, but um, still the wind can be fairly steady offshore and the capacity factor might go up considerably uh, without having to drive in the pile driving. And uh, they could uh, uh, do uh, seismic surveys uh, based in the floor rather than uh, from the surface. So uh, that's another way of looking at the future. Um, coming now to just some thoughts that precede Cousteau, he, he, uh, I think he felt one of his ways that he could help the world would be to get the world to appreciate and love and therefore value the sea if we really want to save it. And he recognized the rewards of keeping agreements as a key factor 
and the wider society hasn't understood how much there is to lose. Most of us simply don't see the connection between healthy oceans and a better future. Uh, and so this is the book uh, uh, that I guess I didn't show you, but this is the front cover of the book. Um, and it's written uh, just this past year by Jean-Michel Cousteau, uh, who's Jacques Cousteau's son. He was born the same year I was. So when we were cruising, we found out to our amusement that we have the same, same uh, age, just a few months apart. Uh, Julie Robinson is a marine ecologist who did some field uh, producer for the PBS television series by the same name. Uh, it's called America's Underwater Treasures. Uh, he founded the Ocean Futures Society, Jean-Michel did uh, uh, 22 years ago to carry out his father's pioneering work. This is just a picture of Holly Lujuis, who was tethered to a ship by a steel cable because these squid that she's playing with uh, are, are able to drag divers into deeper waters. I think she's only doing this to uh, introduce us to, to uh, creatures that we don't see and get people to appreciate them. This was done in the, uh, uh, they migrate from the Sea of Cortez in Mexico, north up the West Coast to Alaska. And um, they're, uh, it only has a lifespan of one to two years, these creatures. So uh, they're trying to, um, point this out to the public, I think, in their book. This is the most important part of their book to me, is the National Marine Sanctuaries locations within uh, the United States uh, and its uh, affiliated uh, locations like American Samoa. He has, a Jean-Michel has a station there uh, and um, uh, in that uh, National Marine Sanctuary also, uh, there's uh, quite a bit of work um, done here in Hawaii. Um, he takes pride in the fact that uh, he showed a movie to uh, George W. Bush and his wife in the White House some years ago. And uh, uh, W. was very proud of the fact that after seeing that movie, he was so impressed that he uh, had a National Marine Sanctuary that included, uh, you can, this is the, these are the populated islands. This is a long um, uh, shoal of, of coral reefs, some of them above water, some below, um, and that go way off to the Northwest because of this evolving hotspot in the um, tectonic plates underneath the ocean. And um, uh, so these are now pretty much off, off limits to most people, unless you have permission to go there as a biologist or ornithologist or, or ichthyologist to have special permission. And it gives a nice protection to the creatures there. Uh, there's uh, another one on the Olympic coast of the state of Washington, quite a bit in California. Uh, this one we talked about here after when I gave a talk last fall about the oil spill, how lucky uh, this was that it was not affected. The oil spill was mostly off of here and did not get over there at all. And it's a very rich, fertile, um, uh, the flower garden banks there, Florida Keys, uh, some reefs here, uh, even all the way up to uh, the Northeast. I was amused at this one, Thunder Bay. I think of Thunder Bay as a fairly good sized city in Ontario, uh, uh, but uh, there is a, a bay <laughs> off of Lake Michigan called Thunder Bay. And there's a, it's not really a marine, but it's a, it's a, a lake uh, sanctuary. So. Uh, I'll show a few more pictures from that book. Uh, this is his, uh, Fabian, I think is, I'm not sure if he's his son or his grandson, I've forgotten, but anyway. Um, yeah, he's the grandson of, Cous of Jacques Cousteau, the son of, uh, of uh, Jean-Michel. And he's studying sea urchins here in the, uh, off of California in a marine sanctuary. Uh, so they keep an eye out in these various sanctuaries and make sure that the things are stable. Um, then I'm, I haven't shown any more pictures. I've just, <laughs> from the books, I've just shown a couple here that I, of my favorite characters, the seahorse on the left and it, looking at it compared to a man's uh, wrist with a, with a wristwatch seemed to intrigue this little seahorse. Over on the right, um, I'm kind of keen on the octopus. Um, this one is called the uh, coral octopus and it, um, coconut, I beg your pardon, coconut octopus. And it has these little fluorescent uh, uh, markers along its uh, borders. And I just think that's a beautiful image. 
of an octopus. I have, I have, uh, haven't seen one quite as pretty as that before, so I just include that to show you. Um, by the way, while we're talking about octopi, uh, I recommend highly to those of you who have Netflix, um, I think it's about a two hour or slightly less um, documentary called The Octopus, My Teacher. And it's about a man who's uh, mentally troubled due to some family issues. Uh, and he decides to spend a year uh, free diving to, uh, uh, to visit and become friends with a, a female octopus uh, growing up um, under a little coral reef uh, next to his home on the shore. And I think that's, I think he's somewhere in the, probably on the coast of California, I've forgotten. It's a wonderful story. And I think you find it uh, uh, tender and enriching. Uh, his son gets quite involved with him as well and, and enjoys some of his father's work. So it's a, it has a nice uh, story. The, this particular octopus uh, uh, finally uh, found a mate and took off, but they had a year together of, of a remarkable friendship between an octopus and a human. I thought it's a fascinating documentary. Uh, just coming to a little bit of more fun, uh, the seahorse. You all probably know that the um, male seahorse uh, uh, cares for the eggs uh, that are uh, provided to him uh, after the female has been fertilized and transfers her eggs to him. So the male is here on the left uh, and he's nurturing uh, the eggs after she has expelled them and given them to her. They have complex mating rituals from the early spring to the midsummer, and they're generally after midnight. So you have to do night dives to appreciate these uh, creatures. And in this one uh, in Korea, they seem to have all kinds of little excrescences and I'm not quite sure what they represent, but it doesn't seem to bother them any. And maybe they like it. I'm not sure if there's a symbiotic relationship uh, with uh, some little uh, microscopic algae maybe or something that like to hang out with them. These are the little baby uh, seahorses that come out of his, uh, um, I suppose, male uterus, it could be called, or uterus-like organ. Interesting um, little creatures. I uh, wanted to show you this one because we've hear, heard a lot about corals bleaching. And uh, on the left uh, are some close-ups, really, really microscopic close-ups of the uh, uh, tentacles of these little corals and showing uh, the colors, these natural brown colors are generated by zooxanthellae. These are, these are algae that uh, have a very close uh, symbiotic relationship with the coral. Um, if uh, they are stressed too much by acid or high temperature, uh, they will, um, they just expel themselves from the coral. I'm not sure whether the coral expels the algae or the algae just take off probably a bit of both. And so what you see here on the right is typical coral bleaching. And here is the uh, part of the coral that has not yet been, um, where the, the uh, algae have not yet been expelled. But it shows you the color tones and the microscopic basis of it uh, uh, from the, um, the natural pigment, mostly provided by the algae inside the coral shell. Um, I think it's a fascinating uh, uh, study. Of course, if the coral bleaching um, lasts for a long enough time, eventually the corals will die. And that's uh, what we've seen progressively in the Florida Keys and also in the uh, more tropical parts of the uh, Great Barrier Reef in Australia and any other, other areas as well. Um, so this is my second last slide. I found this, came by the other day. I was looking at some wonderful pictures that were sent along and I thought this was pretty striking. It's a, it's a wave uh, photograph from below, a nice big uh, beach with a, a lovely big wave rolling from left to right. And you see off to the left, it's very clear water. I, I, in all the times I've been diving, I never 
was diving in water with that level of clarity. It looks to me like 20 or 30 feet or more, maybe 50 feet of visibility, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, and off to the right, you can see a couple of rocks uh, lying on the, on the sand as you're getting closer to land. And uh, I titled the slide, The Last Fish, because you can see in the center a fish swimming away, uh, just a, a little symbol of maybe uh, what uh, uh, Deborah Wright might have wanted to put in her book. Uh, and so uh, this is a, a final slide inviting you to uh, give me any questions that you have in mind or comments. It's a neat slide of the sunset taken by a camera that has uh, lighting below it to light up the coral reef below and no lighting above so that can appreciate the, the, sun, the setting sun above the water and the water just sort of dividing the photograph in half. I find that a fascinating um, uh, study of sea life that we don't often appreciate. So I'm open to questions and I will um, stop sharing the screen so that I can see you folks. Um, I see a couple of chats here. Um, I'm having trouble with something up there. There we go. I've got something here from Schellenberger. I don't know if who submitted this. But anyway, let me read it anyway, because it has something to do with fish. Uh, Schellenberger sees GMO fish, um, GMO standing for genetically modified fish, um, aqua bounty as a solution to overfishing. What is your opinion of fish manufacturer aqua bounty? Um, I'm not sure that I have opinions yet. I don't know enough about the genetics of fish. Um, the Monzo whole food bans GMO which I see as anti-science, I would agree with that. I think the, there is a European uh, wide emphasis to ban all genetically modified organisms, what I think is over the top. Um, we accept uh, all kinds of things over here, including GMOs, but the Europeans don't. And we just have these funny um, continent-wide uh, concerns, GMO fruits, GMO vegetables, GMO animals. Thanks to approval by the FDA, genetically modified salmon is the first genetically modified animal to win approval from the FDA. Uh, the GMO salmon has been deemed safe for consumption, ending an almost 20 year struggle by the fish manufacturer, Aqua Bounty Technologies to sell the salmon in stores. I didn't know of this and I thank whoever submitted this. Uh, yeah, I did, Brian Campbell. Hi, Brian. I don't think I know you. You don't. <laughs> well, welcome anyway. This is my first time attending. <laughs> well, good. Uh, I'm glad that you submitted the question. It's very provocative and I'm delighted. Now, tell me a little bit about uh, how much the salmon have been genetically modified. Can you inform us a little bit about that? Well, I don't know everything about um, the, um, I'm just pro GMO because I see this, um, research and um, agriculture as uh, preventing overfishing, like in your diagram, you can see that there's more agriculture um, tonnage than there is wild caught right now. Yes. So I see that for growing populations, especially in the developing world that needs this protein and needs the health benefits from fish as being able to to um, coexist with out overfishing the wild stock and saving the wild stock in the oceans and also giving developing countries and and world population fish i i agree with you i think it's uh it's crucial give me your last name again brian i didn't write it down campbell campbell and are you a member of, of uh, Plato by any chance? Um, I found this from um, another um, 
I, I'm a member of the uh, climate uh, um, coalition. Coalition. Sure. Yeah, I know them well. I'm a member too. Okay. And that's how I got the um, uh, link to the Zoom. Well, so I've been just listening along about how you've explained um, the oceans are in crisis and that type of thing. Yeah, I I um, uh, I, I appreciate that, uh, and you're welcome to attend anytime. Um, you you let me deal with the with the second thing about growth hormone in GMO fish and this frankenfish. Uh, growth hormone has been used in more than fish, and uh, uh, people are very concerned about growth hormone. But it's a silly fear because growth hormone is a polypeptide. It is not based on any cholesterol ring formation that can tolerate uh, the acids in the stomach. And polypeptides like growth hormone are immediately broken down in our stomachs and have no activity thereafter um, as soon as they, they reach the stomach. Uh, so uh, the whole idea of Franken, frankenfish is, uh, is just about as wild as uh, uh, people's uh, relating nuclear power to green goo um just uh, <laughs> no relationship at all i think the the simpsons has clouded uh, a lot of american mentality about nuclear energy and uh, uh just as the uh, uh europeans are terrified of gmos and i don't understand the rationale for that i do think that it should be overseen obviously but um uh, I don't have any problem with growth hormones. I think growth, uh, for, so far as our health is concerned, growth hormones, uh, I think, are harmful to cattle and lead to arthritis. They have to treat the, uh, the cattle because of the, of the growth hormone, I think, in other ways that they're fed. Uh, they're, they're overweight, and they uh, end up being treated with diclofenac to prevent their arthritis. Uh, I happen to take diclofenac for arthritis, too, but the but the poor cattle, when they pass away out in the fields, they're eaten by vultures and the vultures can't handle diclofenac and they rapidly die uh, when they feed on such cattle. So, so it's a long winded story to say that we have to be careful what we do with growth hormone. And I, I respect uh, some cares there, but, but to call a, a growth hormone treated salmon frankenfish is a, is a bit over the top. Yeah, and I'm, I'm all in favor. So, so I honor and appreciate the philosophy behind um, uh, Deborah Wright's book. Um, I think she has some interesting points, but I, I bring to your attention her book because um, I think she has a refreshing way of looking at it and she brings a lot of other uh, knowledge to us that I would never have come across about the law of the sea and all the other, all the other uh, uh, rules and regulations that have been made and who signed them and who didn't. So I found it uh, very informative and share it with you for that reason primarily. But thank you very much, Brian, for your comment. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll have to look up uh, um, Aqua Bounty um, and see what, uh, what they have to say. But if they're opposed to GMOs, then uh, are they? Um, the Drax.com is, and uh -huh. um, GMOs, are um, you can't buy any GMO like in Whole Foods, Amazon, or um, most mm -hmm. um, of the supermarkets in the United States. Yeah. How, how often, um, if, if, if I go to a regular grocery store um, and get a salmon, uh, Atlantic salmon uh, uh, farmed in Chile, is it likely to have been fed uh, growth hormone? Well, you can buy a regularly farmed um, salmon and like whole foods yeah but they banned any um of aqua bounty and um some other ones have banned it too but like um some markets will probably offer the offer it i'm i'm just saying like whole foods bans gmos sure okay well thank you for bringing that to my attention and um also, um, I read about this in um, Michael Schellenberger's book um, uh, called Apocalypse Never, um, Why Environmental Extremism um, 
leads us to whatever and to bad things, I guess. <laughs> I right. can't remember the whole title, but it's a pop because never. Yeah, I've not read his book, but I, I know him well, and I've read some of his other books. Uh, I didn't didn't. Well, this book, his latest book, is very good. Okay, well, thank I, you for that. Um, it really shows the the. To Come me, on. It shows the money, um, in the environmental uh, movement, where okay. it comes from, and that type of thing. Thank you, Brian. We'll move on to some other questions now. I appreciate your input. Um, got a couple of other people waiting here. Julie, do you want to? Uh, do you have a question? If not, the hands up here from Dorothy Boatman. Dorothy. Yes, I wanted to make a comment about one of the concerns about any genetically modified organism. It's basically an alien species that can potentially outcompete native species. So I think we always have to worry about them escaping into the natural environment and displacing the natural fish. So my concern would be not in terms of any nutritional value or being toxic to humans, but they are always potentially invasive species. Good point. I, I agree with you. And I think they, all of these things should be very carefully monitored. Also, I know from, uh, um, what we're reading I've done about fish farming is that they say, well, we'll be very careful that these, these fish won't uh, get out of our, our uh, containment, but they do. <laughs> and uh, uh, I've spent enough time with fish uh, to know that that's bound to happen sooner or later. So that's a good, very good point, Dorothy. Thank you for making that. Julie, we'll try and see if, if I think you're muted. Maybe you need to see if I can unmute you. Uh, can you unmute yourself and then we could hear you? Hi, my only comment was back in the beginning when you were mentioning about bycatch. Yes. Uh, I wondered if you could redefine what you meant by that. Yes, I meant to do that. And thank you for asking that question. Um, bycatch refers to an, an issue when you have specialized fishing. Uh, if you are a fisherman and you have some sort of a, a trap or mechanism for catching fish and have a, a, a medium, a, a way to sell anything that you catch or eat anything that you catch, that's not a problem. Uh, you are not gonna have bycatch, but most fishermen today are highly specialized. And so there, there are uh, uh, fishermen specialized in shrimp fishing and Trying to think of the the uh, the other shellfish that we all love. Um, it's shaped. It's a muscle. It's shaped like a like the shell of gasoline scallop. Scallop. Uh, there is there are flutes in Nova Scotia in particular that are specialized in in trapping um, scallops. Any anything that comes up in their traps that is not what they have a market defined for, whether it be shrimp or scallops or oysters or whatever. Anything else that comes up is called bycatch. And particularly if there's no opportunity for uh, either eating it or selling it, then it is by definition bycatch. It's, it's not caught for any utilitarian purpose and therefore should be uh, uh, avoided at all, if at all possible. And uh, um, particularly in shrimp boats, it's not done. And so all these vertebrate uh, uh, fish that come up on the decks are just allowed to die there from asphyxiation and then um, and then just dump back in the sea. Now, those fish, if they're on the open seas, those will be totally consumed before they get to the bottom. So it's not totally wasted, but on the other hand, um, uh, it's, it's a wasteful, process uh, to, to lose uh, uh, biodiversity, to lose uh, uh, living creatures that are just wasted again and thrown away. So that's what I mean by bycatch. And it's, uh, um, people are making great efforts now to avoid um, bycatch in, in larger creatures such as turtles, dolphins, um, uh, other creatures that used to get in the nets. 
uh, but uh, vertebrate fish all too often are, um, are a problem with bycatch in, um, in shrimp boats. Another question from you, Dorothy. Is that right or, or have you, any, any other questions? Um, yeah, I was wondering how you felt about um, offshore wind. You had a diagram as far as the um, yeah. um, the, the, the noise generation from offshore wind. Yeah, to me, that's... we're doing 23 gigawatts is what we've got planned in New York and Massachusetts and New England to go off of the um, offshore of, of our area in the Atlantic, the Cape Cod and Long Island areas. And I just see that as a total threat to both sea, to both birds, ocean birds out there and wildlife because of the noise. I agree with you. I'm, I'm, I think it was initially attractive, uh, particularly in the North Sea, when Germany found that, that they didn't have enough wind and sun they're at the latitude of Newfoundland and Labrador. And so they weren't doing too well with, with on land wind and, and sun. And so they decided to, to put some, some wind turbines out in the North Sea. Um, but for the United States to do it, when we have so much room for nuclear plants to be putting offshore wind, it seems, even though it blows more regularly there, um, there are certainly a lot of disadvantages uh, sooner or later, those turbines are going to have to be taken down, just embedding them uh, with the uh, uh, piling that has to be done to provide a proper foundation for them. Uh, I, I agree with you. I think it's a problem for the fish, both the noise of in their installation, and there probably is some um, uh, problems with simply the noise of the blades overhead. Um, now they talked, uh, I mentioned in the, showed in the lower slide, somebody suggested a floating um, uh, offshore turbine where they could be on an island, a floating island, perhaps a group of three or four, and that might work. Um, but um, I think probably could be tested in a smaller um, stage and seen what the ramifications are. Of course, there are the basic problems of any wind turbine uh, they're very hard to recycle. Uh, both the blades and the turbines themselves are, are consumptive, as well as the, the concrete uh, used to embed them. Um, and they only last for 20 or 25 years. And their highest capacity factor is, is in general, 30%. Uh, 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 it might go higher than that to 40% offshore. I've not heard of anything higher than that. So yeah, I, I have some some problems with that. I think that that um, there was this fellow out on the West Coast, uh, Stanford, by the name of um, hmm, momentarily blocking on his name, but he wrote a he wrote a several books and articles uh, about uh, uh, going 100% uh, renewable and claimed that we could do it by building more hydro plants and which is not very feasible at this point in this country and uh, uh, more wind and solar and we wouldn't need uh, nuclear plants. And that is uh, of course a myth that uh, is most unfortunate and and uh, she's our, our uh, speaker last week uh, dealt effectively with that um, problem. So yeah, there, there's some significant uh, problems with the so-called renewable energies that last in general only about 20 years and um, uh, are very intermittent, have a very low energy density. And we accept those glibly without uh, giving any serious attention to nuclear. And I noticed that I was looking at articles today about where we're going uh, at the moment. There are all kinds of energy policy decisions being made. And I don't know if they ever get around to mentioning nuclear, but in the introductions that I've been reading from science and several other um, uh, news feeds, I just talk about clean energy and zero carbon emission energy, but it's as though people are afraid to mention the word nuclear. It's a it, uh, really poisonous word. And I think it's unfortunate. 
but I'm a little off topic here. Any other comments or questions? Um, so there's a comment here, aqua bounty as a solution to overfishing is farmed in warehouses and unlike currently farmed fish are not in ocean pens and do not need antibiotics. That's interesting. I think I've heard of that. Um, it's nice that they don't need antibiotics and that they're in open pens. I did read a little bit about uh, a couple of organizations that must be part of that group, uh, both on the Pacific and the Atlantic. Um, I think it's it's perhaps hard to scale them up, but um, I'll, I'll look into their, their website. Thank you for introducing me to that. Richard, can you hear me? Yes, Lee, sure can. <clears throat> so I, I don't know if you saw my question there. I was no. wondering where in the world they um, do that reef destruction by beating the fish out of the coral reef. Is mostly... that really widespread or is it just specific areas or where? I think it's uh, off of Thailand and uh, possibly uh, some other southeastern, possibly in parts of Indonesia. Um, it's just a, a local problem, but it's tragic because uh, those are problems where seahorses thrive and uh, um, uh, other lovely creatures that add to the diversity. And um, even though it's not widespread, um, it, it's tragic. Uh, to do this to reefs that take a long time to build. If I may just diverge a little bit from your question, um, uh, I found there was a fascinating story. There's an English woman who came to Southeast Asia and um, started to look into the seahorse problem because she found that seahorses were being collected and sold for people to put in their aquaria. Now, it's not that you cannot have a seahorse in an aquarium, but it is probably one of the most difficult of all tropical fishes uh, to manage. And so she felt that uh, she had to do something. And so she formed a, an agreement with the uh, seahorse collectors off of the coast of China, I think in this case, and made an agreement. She found a way to, to uh, grow them in a little farming type of environment. And she promised the Chinese that she would teach them how to do this successfully, but only if they agreed to replace half of the bounty into the sea and only harvest half for Aquaria. I, I haven't heard a follow-up on that, but I thought it was a cute story because uh, it was an example where, where you were trying to negotiate with the rogue fishermen uh, a way to avoid policing them, but perhaps checking with them from time to time to make sure that they were adhering to the agreement. And I thought that was interesting, but I have yet to track that down and get a follow-up. If I do, I'll let you know. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, thanks for your question, Lee. Thank you. I see Mert, Mert has his hand up there, Mert. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the many diverse creatures that were in those uh, sea photos you sent us in that email a couple days ago. Oh, yes. Are, are they part I mean, it just looks like they're part of the evolutionary history of our planet. Is that is that something that has ever been studied and looked at and commented on? Uh, I think I'm, I'm not quite sure where you're going with the question, but uh, I can just tell you that it's uh, at least it's over 10 years old. Uh, it was sent to me by somebody in France, some relative, I expect. And um, uh, I forgot to tell you that it wasn't a true video. It was a PowerPoint where you could push the slides, but I think most people figured that out and had some very nice music. And if you went faster than the music, you ended up with a little bit of music reserve. And if you were well-timed with the music, they ended about the same time. Um, so far as the fish, I just thought it was, it was a nice uh, display of the diversity of fish. I'll, I'll admit to you this little point, it doesn't answer your question, but, uh, I've been intrigued with fish, as you all know now, uh, from a tender age. And at one point after I finished interning in Montreal, I thought seriously about doing graduate work 
uh, on the genetics of the colonial tunicate. And most of you probably don't know what a tunicate is, but it's a vertebra, it's a chordate. It has a cord in part of its natural history, but it doesn't develop a vertebrate. So it's not part of the vertebrate subphylum, but it is part of the overall phylum of chordates. Curious little creature, and some of them grow in a colonial fashion. And I wanted to go to, to uh, 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 Faint Woods Hole in Massachusetts and study them. And I could only do that if I became a, a student of marine biology out of Syracuse University. Anyway, it's a long way of saying that, that uh, tunicates probably showed up in those slides. I think they did, along with many other uh, things. So in that sense, it was showing diversity, I think, more than evolution. But uh, it's, it's fascinating, the creatures that uh, are in the sea. It is, I can see where your question is coming from in the sense that, that we all evolved originally in the sea and in various forms uh, came up on land from the, the, from the time that plants came up and, and uh, as oxygen was made by the cyanobacteria enough uh, for um, more specialized creatures, the, um, we, we came in, out from the sea and then some of us went back to the sea like the whales and the dolphins. And so, uh, so but the sea is the, is the bed of evolution. And um, um, I suppose we're looking for some lakes and riverbeds now in Mars that may have had the most primitive forms of uh, life, but certainly water is the key. And uh, um, so I agree with you that the slides did show, um, in showing biodiversity gave us clues to the, the ideas of evolution. I guess it just felt like I was looking at uh, dinosaurs yes. in, a, in a mini, in a micro form almost. Yeah, I think that's a good way of doing it. Um, that's very good. I see a question from Buland Atale, and I'm glad to see you here, Buland. I heard you were going to join us. Do you have a comment or question? Yes, my comment is just to endorse your, uh, your uh, endorsement of the film Octopus, My Teacher. Yes. We saw it, we were surprised at how, ex how good it was. To me, what it demonstrated was the type of intelligence these creatures have that we really haven't understood before. They can open a jar, the top of a jar by twisting it and get inside the jar and get out afterwards. And the uh, diver who does this, the South African, I believe he was a teacher, a filmmaker, uh, snorkels rather than using uh, aqua lungs to do this. It takes special training, it seems. He stays under for three or four minutes at a time. But thank you for bringing that up. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for your comment. I agree with you. I'd, I'd forgotten that it was done in South Africa, but I think you're right now that I think of it. It was a, a lovely story. And I was so impressed by his ability to free dive. And uh, each time I would watch the film, I would wonder who is, who is staffing the camera and how can he be holding his breath? I got breathless while watching the interactions. But the most important point that you bring up, I think, is the intelligence of the octopus. That was, that was brought out in, in a, a wonderful movie, children's movie called Nemo or Searching for Nemo. And you may recall the octopus was very active in, in um, helping some of the creatures escape from the aquarium. It was a terribly amusing um, uh, thing, but again, Again, uh, the octopus we're beginning to recognize is highly intelligent, and and uh, this was, uh, as opposed to Nemo, a real serious demonstration of that. That was good. So thank you for that comment. Any other thoughts? Let's see if I can scroll around here. Oh, there, there's yours. Um, yeah, Brian is uh, giving some some um, offshore wind, he points out to, uh, to us that uh, there's a website at forbes.com and then um, the subtype un under sites 
Robert Bryce. Robert Bryce is famous for uh, doing podcasts and various stories promoting uh, different forms of energies. He's fascinated by it. And this particular one uh, of Robert Bryce's was done on the, uh, it looks like on the February the 5th of this year, offshore wind plans will drive up electricity prices and require massive industrialization of the oceans. Uh, very good point. So yeah, I think we all agree on that one. Um, somebody called East Wing. Uh, I am familiar with the work of NREL and know they are being very conscientious about the construction and siting of wind turbines. So that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, uh, there's another comment. Um, that Brian makes uh, that the uh, the wind turbines are totally land-based except for the ocean H2O, which is filtered. Belfast, Maine rejected Aqua Bounty plant as anti-science. So uh, uh, it's something that we'll need to look into and think about Aqua Bounty. Um, I have no opinion yet because I haven't haven't really studied them, but I've I remember a few years ago looking into the idea of having these spherical uh, floating pens of fish. And um, uh, it'd be interesting to study further. So um, I should- I have another question, Richard. And this is both to you and to Brian. I, I was sure. just wondering why you're not uh, concerned about GMO foods for human consumption without testing them out and some kind of a trial to see, you know, if they're really compatible with people's body. I mean, if you've genetically uh, put in like an insecticide into corn, uh, couldn't that be possibly harmful to humans? I'm just wondering. Absolutely. I didn't mean to give the idea that that uh, I'm opposed to GMOs, or that I'm that I'm for any GMOs. I, I'm not. Um, I think each one should be evaluated carefully. Um, by the safeguards that are existing and perhaps uh, in, even enhanced safeguards. Um, my concern was for people who, who blanket um, things like use the term GMO. I hate all GMOs. It's like I hate all nuclear reactors or I hate all this or that. Um, I think much as we disparage um, uh, wind turbines, uh, both offshore and on and, and solar panels, I think we need to work with them and not blanketly dam or, or rule out a certain option. So uh, I think GMOs can be useful, but I agree with you completely Lee, that uh, they should be uh, checked and made sure that there's uh, we do not lose into the wilds uh, some rampant species. I used to work on a committee when I was at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. I used to chair what's called the Biohazards Committee and I don't know if you remember you younger people, but uh, there was a moratorium declared around 1975 or so on, uh, in Boston. They refused to allow people to do any work on recombinant DNA for fear that uh, uh, some cancer oncogenes would get uh, into uh, E. coli and uh, move through the entire septic systems of the world and uh, promote cancer. Um, it was a, it was a big scare, and uh, Boston uh, voluntarily made this uh, moratorium. It lasted for several months, and it it upset a lot of people with their research plans at uh, MIT and elsewhere. But it uh, it eventually got sorted out. But it I remember designing what are called P four biocontainment facilities in New York, and at the time I kept thinking to myself, these are white elephants. Uh, we need to, um, this is a medical school, we need to be doing some cancer research. I don't know that we need to have a P4 facility in every medical school. And uh, so I think we overreacted for a while. Um, but th there has to be a balance, Lee, I agree with you, and we certainly should be careful of uh, GMOs. Well, you know, I was just trying to think about, you know, the digestive process. And after you swallow this food and it goes down to your stomach, it gets disassembled to some degree there, right? 
or and maybe the reason people are saying all GMOs, like I've seen what Brian's saying, are safe is because <clears throat> the, the food gets <clears throat> so disassembled as soon as it hits your stomach that uh, it doesn't matter what's in it other than <laughs> the atoms that I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know to what extent your stomach really takes these things apart, you know, the food you eat. Sure. I was only talking about growth hormonally, <clears throat> and that's a simple polypeptide that um, unless you had very, very weak acids in your stomach would be, uh, there, there are enzymes in the stomach that break down the polypeptides of growth hormone very quickly. There are lots of other things in your food that are not broken down. You're absolutely right. And I think the GMO dangers are more um, if the nucleic acid um, were to become um, integrated in with the DNA of a common organism of the body, such as Escherichia coli of our gut, oh, something okay. like that could be could be really a, a problem. Um, ah, all right, but, I didn't think so of that. that. Was, yeah, that was why the uh, the moratorium in Boston. I think it was overdone, but I I used it as an example of uh, it was a rational thing. Um, there was a famous uh, biochemist in California who helped to author that um, uh, symposium out in California that, that uh, all of, many of us went to. And it was a very serious meeting, but we've, we've learned, I think since then to, to build in to these uh, genetically modified organisms, two or three safeguards so that they would not survive once they get out of the laboratory. And, and these sorts of things have to be done very rigorously and pass biohazard committees at every major uh, biological institution. So there's a lot of controls going on uh, everywhere today still. Um, it's not loosely done, but the, I think there could be more controls over the food we eat and uh, uh, the drugs we take, and particularly um, some of the over-the-counter uh, Chinese herbs. I think we, there's very little control over those. We should be very careful. But that, those don't have GMOs in them, but, but they're, they're just, uh, uh, it's amazing what's on the internet these days and uh, the various things that they still promote where there's just no uh, policing of the kind of uh, stuff you can buy over the internet. Right. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of those herbs and a lot of the supplements that they sell. I mean, I've, I've tried some supplements that I've really reacted badly to. So I'm right. very cautious about that. Well, I just don't take supplements much anymore. Sure. Right. Yeah. Very good thinking. I'm just curious, who is, who is East Wing? Can, can you identify? Is it all right to identify who you are? Sure. It's actually Mike and Lynn Green. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> okay. Glad to know who it is. That's cute. Well, um, and I, I can't speak intelligently on the subject because I'm not a scientist, but I just felt I wanted to interject. Um, our daughter works for NRO, and she's a, uh -huh. actually, her background, she's a biological oceanographer who got her PhD from Woods Hole. So she's extremely conscientious about the environment. And she's actually working on wind turbines in the ocean. And I just know that they're being extremely conscientious from the discussions I hear from her about the impact on the environment and on ocean life. And she did her research on planktons. And so she's, she's very conscientious about it. So I just I wanted to interject that into the discussion. I appreciate that. And if you or if she would like to join us as a discussant sometime, we have our last session of the year, you may have noticed, is a general discussion. And uh, it's called a group discussion. It's a review of a Faustian bargain and discussion of our future on April the 26th. So if you want to gather some data from her or invite her to attend with us, we could all talk about that. That's an open free for all and a, and a great time without okay. anybody having to prepare a, 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 you know, slides or anything. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Um, I'm going to remind you a little bit uh, before we depart that uh, next Monday, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Maroon will speak to us about the Atlantic Ocean Circulation and Climate. Uh, she's from the Oceans and Climate Lab here at the University of Wisconsin. I've written to her a couple of times lately and haven't had a reply, but I know she did reply favorably, and I will give her a, a reminder between now and next Monday, again, to make sure that she's ready to, uh, to speak to us. I'm looking forward to uh, 
this because there's been a lot in the news lately about AMOC, the Atlantic uh, Meridian uh, Oscillation of the Oceans, and uh, uh, some talk about the uh, weakening of the Gulf Stream as a result of change salinity and temperature of the waters off of Greenland, south of Greenland, and how much that might affect the weather in Northern Europe. Uh, but that's, uh, that's just a subset, I think, of her interests in ocean circulation and in uh, how it might affect uh, our climate. So I'm really looking forward to that next week and hope you can all join in. It's now uh, 11.33. Um, I think we, we've um, had a good chance for discussion, but anybody would like to raise any questions? Um, we've had a, I've appreciated your discussions and uh, looking forward to seeing you next week. And I'll continue to send you uh, some little bits and pieces too over the weeks. So thanks for all attending today. Have a great one and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye everybody.